they got to make them seasick. <laughs> and beans didn't make me sick. Mm -hmm. Only time I didn't get sick out of that ocean was when we landed. We come down those rope ladders and the kind of a net outfit, you know, it wasn't yeah. just a, one ladder. Anyway, sometimes they was 20 foot away from that boat. Next time they was up against it. But I was in the wire cutting section, the leader of it. So I had to get off first, which I did. And we got in a landing craft. There's 33 men in it, besides the war cutting section, plus the Navy people. I think the figures are right. Anyway, I had five men in the war cutting section. We had what they call Bangalore torpedoes. It was iron pipe with Amatol in each end and dynamite in the middle. And uh, what? Sorry, what's what's Amatol? It's an explosive. It's a lot stouter than dynamite. Oh, okay. When it goes off, it made the dynamite blow straight up. Okay. So that was the way they cut the wire. Anyway, why we got off in water about waist deep. We had a big pack on our back, plus that, that ammo torpedo, plus our M1 rifle, a few hand grenades, and bangalores, and um, we had two bangaliers of torpedo, of shells around us, plus the ones in our belt. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty well loaded. And we had to go across that water. We couldn't go back. There wasn't nothing behind us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we had to go forward. <clears throat> and I went across the beach with a machine gun hitting the ground three foot in front of me, just knocking up sand. And I couldn't, couldn't stop. Couldn't get any faster. He never did raise it high enough to hit me. Uh. I got up to the shore then and shoot machine guns was in those pill boxes and we didn't have anything to knock them out with. Just an M1 rifle and a hand grenade. We threw our hand grenades at that hole, but we didn't knock them out. Anyway, why? Well, we had the Germans on the banks pretty well whipped. We were we was pushing them back anyway. We was uh, holding our own, mm -hmm. doing lots of shooting. Anyway, uh, I heard later then something knocked the pillboxes out, but I heard later then that the man over the battleships said he had uh, orders to shoot way over our heads, not close to us at all, <clears throat> but uh, seeing we was hung up, he ordered the battleships in close to shore, lowered their big guns, and he shot about six, seven feet, eight over our heads, knocked them pillboxes out, and he turned us loose. I give the Navy credit for saving the invasion mm -hmm. if they done that all up and down that beach. Why they didn't knock the pillboxes out first, I don't know, but mm -hmm. they didn't. Anyway, why we got in, we fought the Germans on in, the, I don't know how many miles, three or four anyway, when dark come. And when dark come, why I had 20 or 30 men, I don't know how many, following me. I don't know why they was following me, but they were. All of them was privates. We didn't have a lieutenant. And you were a private. 
I was a private. We didn't have a corporal, non-common, no kind, just privates. Anyway, when morning come, why, I told these, they asked me what I was going to do. I said, I'm going to stay here at daylight. I ain't going no further than it dark. I could hear shooting over here and over there and out in front, but uh, not in front of us, but out on each side. Daylight come, why, we'd go just about out of, out of ammunition. And I said, well, I'm going to get some ammunition. I went back to the beach. I knew all of those dead men had ammunition. And I, I'm not going to tell you that I got it off of the dead men because my mind won't let me remember it. But I did get ammunition. Mm -hmm. I, uh, that's the first time I'd seen the beach. I, when it was behind us, we didn't see anything. Mm -hmm. But there was... There was dead men everywhere. Oh, yeah. The, the water was even bloody along the edge. Anyway, why? Well, I got the ammunition. I seen down the beach a little ways they had wounded soldiers. I went down there and this man in my platoon, and I tried to talk to him, but he had a bandages all around his head, he couldn't talk. But anyway, went back into the where it was supposed to be up on top. <clears throat> and we went, I don't know what direction, I think we went north, but I'm not sure of that. Anyway, all these men have fallen me. I went up to, I found a, a road they called it sunken roads. Mm -hmm. We would have called it a branch with a little water running down the middle of it. But uh, they had been all kind of fighting there. There was dead men, Americans and the Germans both, burnt out equipment. And anyway, I went on up that road to the little town of Vierville, Samir, France. Mm -hmm. And there was a lieutenant there when I walked up said, Sergeant, put your men in that hole right there. We're going to take this town. And I said, all right, but I'm not a sergeant. I'm a private, just like the rest of these men. He said, you are now. Hmm. From that time on, I was a sergeant. Wow. So you got a battlefield commission right. from second, private to sergeant. The second day. Anyway, why we fought and got to the little town of Beer Samir and took yeah. it. Fought on the way to St. Lowe. 115th it was taken St. Lowe too at the same time. We, uh, well, we we'll say we cleaned up after they went through. The, mm -hmm. They just made us force through the middle, you know, and left the rest of it. Anyway, when we got through St. Lowe, we all got back with our regular units after that. We, okay. And so, I was put over the third squad. Okay. So can I go back a little bit? Um, uh, what Tony had a, a good question. You know, that first night after you guys were on shore, and you've gone through June sixth, and it's nighttime. What was the mood like with your men? The guy, well, they weren't your men at the time; they were following you. But what was the feeling like among everyone? Did everyone were they upbeat? Was everyone just still? I mean, I'm sure it was still very much uncertain which way the battle was going to go. Well, <clears throat> I think they were just like I was. <clears throat> we were all. Um, we were all trying to live. That is the main thing. And uh, we stayed there till daylight. Of course, we all slept right there beside a hedgerow that we, and 
by that time you so tired you would sleep. Yeah. And we slept till till daylight. That's when I went back after ammunition. Uh, far as uh, thinking we had won anything, we didn't think. To, we just know we had to go further. Um, have, have you seen um, lots of movies about D-Day? I mean, you've probably seen The Longest Day. Have you seen Saving Private Ryan? Yeah, I've seen them both. Um, <coughs> what do the movies about D-Day get right and what do they get wrong you know well <laughs> i don't hardly know enough about it to tell you that exactly one of the things and i noticed in most of these movies that privates didn't get along with the sergeants and the, and the second lieutenants that's mostly what we had was was we had a few first lieutenants, but very seldom. But there did none of that go on. That wasn't right. Uh, we all knew we had to depend on each other. Mm -hmm. Nobody give me a cussing because I told them to go do something like they do in the movies. Mm -hmm. The sergeant never, I don't say never because it did happen one time. They didn't, we didn't fight among each other. Uh, and we really didn't all get acquainted because we didn't have time. Mm -hmm. But as a whole, why, we done what we had to do. Okay. Whenever you came in on your landing craft that morning, uh, was it HR? Was it 630? Was that about when you came in or were you yeah. a little before that? Okay. You come in. I think it went down in history that we landed at 6.30. That's okay. when we were supposed to. Now, that was, was that low tide at that point? I couldn't tell you yeah. that. Yeah, okay. I don't know. It would... Well, was there a lot of beach that you had to cross before oh, you yeah. ever got to oh, the yeah. to the shingle Lots and everything? Beach. Okay. At least as much as a football field, you know. Right, okay. So, I'd heard that. Something like that. Now... Were there Belgian gates there also? Uh, the big iron piece oh, yeah, that yeah. that you had to go around, they would funnel you through, and then, then you'd be right in their lines of fire? Yeah. How did you guys take those out? We didn't. Really? No, we went we went around. You know, they were there to keep the ships from coming up close to shore. Uh -huh. No, we just kept going forward. Okay. Uh we didn't have anything. Our all of our support grounded out in the ocean. Uh, all of the artillery, the tanks that they was going to make float in rubber deals, they all sunk out there. We didn't have anything behind us, and uh, of course that made it a lot worse than it mm. would have been if we'd had something knock them pillboxes out with. And all of this same time, them big shells was busting everywhere. And uh, I'm sure they killed a lot of us. Mm -hmm. But this, the ones on the bank did too. Mm -hmm. Now, um, uh, when you uh, landed, um, you described in your biography that uh there was no one in front of you uh now was that later that you realized that or was that uh, i know that company e you guys landed what was your target beach that you were supposed to land at was that easy green easy green yeah okay yeah. now did you land at easy green where were you no. actually landing we, where did we you land? landed further further down we missed part of easy green we we man we didn't land where we were supposed to we landed further down okay but uh i understand that there were some currents along the shore that kind of everyone veer you know kind of drifted left as they were coming in and then you had that plus you had strong winds from the same direction plus 
uh, there was a lot of smoke and everything in the air. So a lot of the landmarks that the landing craft captains were looking for, they couldn't see. Yeah. Yeah. So they were aiming for whatever and they got, you guys kind of all got scattered a bit. Well, of course that part of it, I don't know. Sure. You know, I don't know anything. I just kind of felt like that the ships out in the ocean went too far down from where they should have been. And mm -hmm. so, of course, I think we made a straight from the boat to the, from the ships to the sand. I think we went in a straight line, you know, mm -hmm. but we did go too far down. And that's where we got mixed up with the first division. Ah. They were down on our, because we were attached to them. And in these men following me, I had 29th men and, and first division both with me, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were all privates, all just like I was. We mm -hmm. wanted to live. And we done it. Well, I'm going to say we did a pretty good job. I think you did, too. <laughs> now, you, you're, you were in the wire cutters. Yeah. And you used the Bangalore torpedo. Did you did you get to use your torpedo? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we blew the wire. Okay. That's when we found out there was nobody behind us. Yeah, and, can you describe what do you mean by that? Like, I mean, what were you, I know you being wire cutters, I've read in these these books – that first off were like the uh, the squad leader sort of guys, and then the wire cutters were right, like right after that coming off. Um, was your and, and we've read a lot about the 116th taking horrific casualties at the landing crafts and everything. Um, what was it like for the rest of them? I mean, did the rest of the men get off of your landing craft, or was it just you guys up front that got off? After we blew the war and we got back, of course, when we put the, our time back little torpedo under it, then we laid down on our bellies and was shooting at soldiers on the bank. And then after we got the war blowed, we looked back and there was nobody behind us. The landing craft we were on had, uh, I think, 33 more soldiers, plus the Navy, and it blew up, and they were all killed right there. Just us six got off of that. Oh, my ago. gosh. That's the reason there was nobody behind I us. I understand. I didn't realize. So um, do they, do you, I guess you probably don't know. I just wonder if they hit a, a landmine on one of the, oh, it was, a, was it artillery that came in? I'm, I'm talking to, I'm looking at uh, Bill's friend, David Rule over here and stuff. And um, so was it, was it an 88? Do you know? It was an 88 that came in? My goodness. Or probably so. Okay. The 88 was the, <laughs> was the most dangerous weapon in the whole, whole deal. way better than we had and the best that Germany had. Mm -hmm. I've heard. No, when you heard that 88, you better hunt you a hole. <laughs> when it quit squealing now, it was it's going to hurt somebody. If it went over, it screamed. It didn't. You could tell it was an 88. Mm. That uh, fellow I was telling you about here that had the song. Yeah. Well, that's, he mentioned that in, that boy did. Whoever wrote that song told about that 88. It was all about the 88. It was, uh, he wrote it on that song that used about the Wabash Cannonball. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the tune to this song. Ah, uh, really? And, and this all went together in a way, but about the 88. You ought to... Can you can you just mention that story for the recording here about this is a local Bixby 
World War II veteran mm-hmm. that you knew. Yeah. And can you just kind of briefly tell us the little story, what, what, what that song's about, or what you, how you found out about this? Well, I've heard his story come out in the newspaper, his name, and it mentioned this song. Well, it had it printed in it, and I read it, and I said, well, and it told where he was, him and some more men were meeting every other Monday or every other, I think it was, I don't know if it's Monday or not. But anyway, I decided just to go over and see him. Uh, they, uh, an officer found this story on a dead soldier, found this song, and he knew this fellow played music back there. So he took the song back to him and gave it to him. That's the way he got it. I hope it wasn't an 88 that killed that boy. Mm-hmm. But he was dead. Mm-hmm. And uh, after I seen it in the paper, well, I decided, well, I'll just go over there when they were going to meet and see if I can get him to sing me that song. And he did. It was three or four of them making different music. You uh-huh. know. He's about my age. Some of them could sing pretty good, and some of them, like me, they'd been better off if kept still. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, why? And I intended to go back, but I never have. Mm-hmm. But I, I just hope that the '88 didn't kill that fella. Mm-hmm. So um, once the guys, you guys all regrouped after you got ashore and you, uh, you know, you, I think you're up. So you were in the Vereville draw. That was the, from what you were saying. If you went up to the town of Vereville, as I understand it, that was the most hotly contested, um, you know, uh, causeway up from the beach, you know, um, up onto the, the plateau and everything. Um, so, uh, as you guys were, um, you know, fighting through that, and you described, you, you saw a lot of, you know, heavy fighting, re- the results of heavy fighting, a lot of equipment and soldiers and everything that, that died. Um, where did you guys go from that point? And you went up and you took Vereville. Did you, did you guys immediately head to St. Lowe or did you kind of hang out? Did you stay there for a few weeks to kind of, or did you immediately start pushing? No, we we never did stop. We went from, we just went from one hedgerow to another. Mm-hmm. Uh, and mostly we were going forward. Mm-hmm. Once in a while, the way we got, had to stop, to, but it was fighting all of that time. It mm-hmm. wasn't, no, we didn't, uh, on the time we got off of when dark come. Mm-hmm. And then they had shell shooting and things at night, but not not like that. Mm-hmm. And I don't know because it was, I was part Choctaw Indian, but it seemed to me like that every time I turned around, I was having to take a patrol out on something. Uh, I always took at least five men with me on patrols, especially nearly at night. And uh, all, I think I could have told them all of everything I found out without going out there, but uh, that ain't the way it works. <laughs> <laughs> well, so a lot has been discussed um, over the years about the hedgerows there in Normandy and the fighting and what was like there. What can you just tell me? What what were your observations on fighting in the hedgerows? Well, of course, in a way, they were something to get behind. <laughs> sure. But then you had to get across them and go across open fields to the next one, you know. And uh, and we did, but 
long as we had them, as long as we had them moving, why we uh, we'd get across. Sometimes, though, it would take more than one day to get across one, but mostly we went from one hedge row to another. Pretty, pretty steady. Yeah. Now we didn't go on a run nowhere, and then. We finally got into where we was going from one town to another town. And, of course, every town was a, was a battle because there's something they could get behind, you know. And we pretty well cleaned them all towns out. Mm-hmm. There was... In one town we went in... Can't think of the name of it now, but it was had been bombed and rebombed. Looked like it was just tore plumb down. But there was basements under nearly every one of them things that had somebody in them. Mm-hmm. A lot of, I guess, civilians. Well, I know they were. But we had to go through them basements to see there wasn't any soldiers left. And we don't know whether there was or not, because if they changed clothes, well, we wouldn't have knew it. You know? Sure. It was, a, I think that would have been probably the, I'm not going to say the scariest thing, but the miserable thing, was walking through them build basements looking for somebody that wasn't there. Oh, I bet. Yeah. And uh you didn't know what them people were going to do behind you, but uh, I think most of them are just civilians. Do you have any close calls on your patrols? Like what was the one of the more, uh, you know, <clears throat> any close-in fighting or anything like that? Well, we never did have any hand-to-hand fighting. That's good. We had a lot of close calls of machine guns. One time, and that was on, I think, on the Ebb River. In a way, I had been in the hospital with my, with my foot at that time, I think. And I was coming back through the division, and uh, I run on to captain out of the E Company, and he saw me and he said, Sergeant, I'm glad you're back. We're going on patrol tonight. (laughs) I said, you could have waited at least till I got back in the company. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he said, we need you. So I took a patrol that night, and that is the only time I can remember that it officer ever went with me. Oh, really? He went on this patrol with me. We went across this river in rubber boats. And I I guess, I don't know exactly how it got to happen. It seems to me like I can remember that them boats had ropes across the river and you pull them mm. and that water flopping in them ropes making off was racket. But anyway, why we got across the other side, going up it, and I heard a machine gun in front of me. I heard this fella pull the thing back and push it forward. It clicked. If you've ever heard one, you'll know what it was. And I stopped. And this lieutenant, he come up beside him and said, what are we stopping for? And I said, well, there's a machine gun up in front of us. And him being the boss, you know, I said, what are we going to do with it? He said, I guess we'll just ignore it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> That's how smart he was. 
Anyway, why I didn't say that. Anyway, why I went on about ten feet. I never did straighten up. I went all stooped over and crawling, and about that time it cut the brush right over our heads. Of course, we all got down on our bellies, you know. And I crawled back in to where the lieutenant was, or the, yeah. And I asked him, I said, do you want to ignore it now? He said, let's get out of here. Wow. <laughs> and I said, we'll take them men back across the river. I'll stay here and see if there's nobody following us. Of course, I was in front, you know. And I did, and I I fired a few rounds where the machine gun I thought was. And then I did. I was raised in along the creeks and the banks. Yeah. So instead of going back down the side of it, I just went over in it. Not into the water, but down it. And went back toward the boat for us to get across. Anyway, we got out of it that way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so after you went through St. Lo, uh, I think at that point you guys, the the army, uh, the Allies came around um, over toward Le Mans, and there was the fillet gap where we tried to encircle the German army there, um, and we tried to pinch them off, you know, by linking up with the British and us coming in from the south there. But the Germans got out of there. Were you involved in any of that fighting? Do you know? Did, do you remember? Or would you even know you were participating in that? Or You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know? No. Okay. No, we didn't know. Well, we didn't know anything. Just mm. put it that way. All we knew was out in front of us and that we were taking ground. You know, mm -hmm. we were pushing them on. So whenever you were done with being a wire cutter on D-Day, what was your primary role from that point forward? Just a frontline patrolman, uh, you know, leading squad, leading patrols and everything? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was, uh, I was over a squad at that time. Finally moved up to over the platoon. Mm -hmm. But uh, we didn't... Well, we just didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. The lieutenants is the one went back to the, found out everything. Half the time, we didn't have any lieutenants. Somewhere down there in Fort Benning, Georgia or someplace, they didn't teach these people to keep their heads down. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they didn't stay with us very long. Really? One time, we had a nice-looking lieutenant come in. First lieutenant and a likable fellow. Well, I'm going to say most of them were, but uh, this man was an exception. And he got shot in the mouth. Bullet went in one side and come out the other. Of course, he was bleeding all over. And medics wrapped his head up and sent him back to the back. And about a couple or three months later, they sent him back to our company. That man had two of the prettiest dimples you ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't hurt his. <laughs> that actually didn't, helped him out, huh? <laughs> it didn't hurt his looks a bit. <laughs> wow. Well, even in war, it, it's been, it benefits some people, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so. When you went from there to to Paris, uh, you know, I, I think Paris was liberated in August. Mm -hmm. Can you describe for me what that was like? The only thing I can remember about it mostly is, is the girls coming out with something to drink. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some water, some... Now, were they uh, kissing you guys? Because I see lots of footage of them coming out. and Well, they would have, yeah. Yeah. They didn't until a bunch I was in, but they would have. <laughs> they were they were people that was very glad to see us. Oh, and yeah. You could tell that. We'd really done something for them. 
and it made us feel good. I bet that was a huge morale boost. Yeah. I mean, then you knew. I mean, of course, there were, I'm sure, some of the small towns you went through, everyone appreciated you guys being there, you know, and so. Yeah, in those smaller towns, we hardly ever seen any civilians. They had either went on ahead of us or they went somewhere. Mm -hmm. Very seldom seen any. One time, one town I went into, I seen two German soldiers run across the road into a building. There was an old French man sitting there. I think he's French. Or, I didn't know where I was at when I was in Germany or Switzerland or wherever. <laughs> but anyway, I, I asked him if there was any German soldiers there and made him understand he couldn't understand what i said but he got shaking his head no no there wasn't and i asked him about them two that i seen run across and i had that 45 out in my hand and that old man got down on his knees begging me not to shoot him and i <laughs> I was trying to tell him I ain't going to shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't do that. Yeah. That is SS troopers that done that. Mm -hmm. We didn't do that. Mm -hmm. None of us that I know of ever shot anybody that didn't need to be shot. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to put it that way. Sure. So uh, after Paris, uh, that would have been August of 44, um, the Battle of the Bulge began in December. What did you do between August and December of that year? Where were, where did you go? Where were, I mean, actually, David, you might remember, you said you have a list of the, the towns and stuff like that. Generally, what path did they take? Um, well, from France, a little bit of Belgium, and then 11 towns in Germany, they took. Okay, but between Paris and when the Battle of the Bulge started, did they were? Do you know exactly the path they were where they were at? Because a lot of times, I mean, I know that there was the Battle of the Hurtgen Forest, which was in November, and uh, you know, prior to that, was just mainly fighting across France. You know, trying to get over to Germany to end the war by Christmas was the hope, and the Hurtgen, um, you know, was considered the most direct route into Germany and was actually very difficult and we got thrown back there and everything but um uh so were you from that point from paris on bill it sounds like you were you know pretty much just town to town fighting well, right they, we had them yeah we did we had them on the move but now that didn't mean that we didn't fight mm -hmm. we uh we lost just as many men and them running backwards as we did them trying to come forward, you mm -hmm. know, they, and because uh, we had all their shells to be put up with, and, and uh, war was going on. It didn't, uh, just because we had them moving, Patton had them all run down to the middle, but he left everything on the sides, you mm -hmm. know. Why? We still had to fight just as hard, and I don't know if I'm, well, it just seemed like every night I got more replacements. I had mm -hmm. lost men every day and got replacements at night. You never got acquainted with them. You never got the, you had their names wrote down on something. Mm -hmm. That's about all. Yeah. No, it wasn't. A, well, it just wasn't an easy thing. It wasn't an, like the movies get acquainted with somebody, and mm -hmm. wasn't hardly like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think in your biography you talk about um, uh, a a younger soldier that that came over to you. This might have been a D Day, um, and was at a foxhole. And everything, um, and 
and you you ended up leaving and then he came back and he had been hit and everything yeah yeah that happened yeah i'll never get over that uh i got these replacement in after dark couldn't see what they looked like they sent them up there but uh, this one soldier he didn't look to me like he was over 15, 16 years old. He probably 18, but just a kid. You could tell looking at him, he was just a kid. Anyway, why I didn't know what to do with him. And I told him, I said, you can be my runner. You stay with me. I had a foxhole dug just which I very seldom got to use, but uh, he would, I told him, I said, put your stuff there and in that hole and go to sleep because we're going to attack in the morning. And he did. <clears throat> and the next morning, my, this is when I, my platoon was uh, in reserve that morning. Most usually we were one of the attacking bunch, but it was third platoon and we left the other platoon attacked first. And they were supposed to send a runner back to tell me when to move up, you know, and they didn't. I went up to see why, and I went across this open field from hedgerow to hedgerow. Anyway, I found them, and they went across the road and was, which they wasn't supposed to do. But they were going up that side of the road, and they hadn't sent a runner back. If they did, he got lost. Anyway, when I got back to my foxhole, a shell had hit this boy in that foxhole, and and blowed his head completely off. Mm. I don't know what he looked like. Mm -hmm. And um, that has bothered me forever mm. that I left him. Of course, that was part of the war. That wasn't my fault, but uh, you take the blame for it mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. No, I'll never get over that. Mm -hmm. Whenever you uh, ended up uh, when the Battle of the Bulge started, uh, what was the feeling like? I mean, I think at the time, the understanding in the military, in the Army, was these guys are basically licked. We're going to, you know, this, we'll, we'll be able to push on in Germany. And then when this offensive started, what? how did you feel? What What was, was your thoughts? You know, we didn't know anything about the Battle of the Bulge. We was in it, but we didn't know. We didn't know what was going on. We were. We were at. I think this is where we were at. I'm pretty sure it was. We were sitting on a river. I called it the Ruhr River, but I don't know for sure that's where it was. But there. Were, they had what they called a sport plaza on the other side. I didn't know what a sport plaza was. It wasn't anything but a bunch of cement buildings, you know, little flat top buildings with not much of anything, which they should have put the artillery on and tore down and didn't. But we crossed this river and we took it, and all of a sudden we got pushed plumb back across the river again. The next night we took it again, and they pushed us back across the river again. Mm. This was the doing of the starting of that Battle of the Budge. We didn't know that they was doing it in a great big circle, you know. We just was a small part of it. And 
nobody said anything about a battle of the bullets while it's going on. That mm-hmm. all come up later. Okay. But uh, we finally, we took the sport plasma the third time and we kept it. But uh, during all of that time, why I had to take patrols up to this river, and I think it was the river. I had to take patrols up there to see where the Germans was, that there wasn't none on this side. I could have told them that before they, before they sent me. But anyway, I took five or six men with me all the time up there. We get up there and they'd shoot machine guns at us. <laughs> we knew where they was at then. Every time we did, our 50 caliber machine guns would start shooting over our heads at them. <laughs> they was more trouble than the German was. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, why that went on for seemed to me like a week or so, but it probably wasn't that long. That's when I that's when I got hit in the shoulder with a piece of shrapnel. Was going up to the take a patrol up to the Ruhr River and cross there. <clears throat> and I didn't go back to the hospital. I didn't. And we heard, and I don't know whether that's so or not. <clears throat> General over us had made an order out if you didn't have a big hole in you, keep you up there. So I imagine that was doing the the bulge part because it didn't have the men to put to replace you with, you know. Mm-hmm. So anyway, why three or four days later though, my shoulder got to where I couldn't use it. Mm. It's hard to shoot an M1 rifle with one hand, you know. Yeah. And I had a good medic, Indian boy. That's another story. Anyway, why? He told me, said, you got to go back and see if it's broke. And he finally sent me back, got back to this VAC hospital. Nurse looked at it, and I told her, I said, well, it don't mount to much. She said, it will when you get old. (laughs) (laughs) And it has. Oh, really? (laughs) It still does. Mm. But anyway, why? Now, so uh, now, did you say is there sh- is there still shrapnel in your shoulder? Is that no? It didn't. It was just a flat piece that broke it. It broke the skin all around, oh. all around, but it didn't go in. Okay. But it bruised it. So well, she just said it looks like hamburger meat from the, the bruise, you know. Wow. Anyway, why well, three days later I was back on the front line. It wasn't broke. Mm. Now, you also were wounded in your foot. Is that correct? Yeah. And what, can you tell me about what happened there? Well, I got a piece of shrapnel just above the sole of my boot. Went in, small piece. We were in a sunken road, and this shell hit, and it was in that mud. And that's what killed most of it. The reason it probably didn't blow my foot off. But this little piece hit me in the foot. We were fighting, getting ready to attack, and did. I could tell there was blood in my boot, but at least something wet in it. And I didn't go back to see about it. Three or four days later, though, my foot had swelled up till I couldn't get my boot off. Mm. Had to cut the things to get get me out. They sent me back to the hospital, and when I got back there, why you wasn't a lieutenant, were you? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, they was two smart lieutenants. <laughs> I guess they're doctors. They are supposed to be in anyway. 
one of them looked at the other and said, we'll have to take it off. It's got gangrene in it. You could have heard me plumb over here. I said, no, you ain't taking my foot off. And I was a little bad to cuss about that time. It wasn't just all like that. Anyway, well, there was a captain heard it. He come over and looked at it. And he said, no, get you a bucket of hot water, fill it full of Epsom salt, put his foot in it just as hot as he can stand it, and keep it that way till it comes to a head, then take it out. And they did, and I've still got my foot. Wow, and my as, goodness. As he walked off, he turned around looked at him he said that's what my grandma would do ha ah, really <laughs> anyway well i still got my foot well that's awesome so as you got where so where did you cross into germany like what was uh do you know about where it was you went over into germany i have no idea what it went into okay. germany or anywhere yeah okay um and you you described uh, linking up with the Russians at the River Elbe. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah. Um, and I don't remember if we talked about that at the beginning or whatever, but you said that they pulled up in trucks and they were all dancing and they had women with them and they were probably drunk and and all that stuff. But what was your impression of the Russian soldier? Well, I thought this guy's peculiar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it had been on a Saturday night, I wouldn't have thought much about it. But, uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> the fight in the middle of a war, why, we th I thought they but anyway, they were nice enough. And yeah. And they were on your side, too. So, I mean, that yeah. that yeah. that's better yeah. than having an, yeah. another enemy, yeah. you know, that's, so. That's the main thing. Yeah. So, um, let me see. Uh, uh Okay, Tony's got a lot of questions here. I need to get to his questions. So um, how did the war change you in the end? You know, what what impact did it actually have on you? Well, it changed my life all over, every bit of it. If, uh, if the war hadn't come along... <coughs> You would have been reading about me in history as a professional bull rider. Mm -hmm. I was, and I know in my mind, I've seen enough of it. I was good. I could ride a bull. Mm -hmm. uh, and I liked it. And I would have been a professional bull rider. I would have won money. I'd have won saddles. I'd have had a name down in history. That's when, when they took two years away from me, though, all of these boys like Jim Shoulders that didn't go, and, well, all of these name brands that was back at that time that got to be champions, why, I'd have been right up there among them. Mm -hmm. if, uh, that's one way it changed. Now the way it changed, uh, when we got out of high school, me and my wife would have got married. We'd had two years of marriage that uh, they cheated me out of. <laughs> uh, and that was the best part of my life. That was another thing. And chances are, if it hadn't come along, I would have bought a farm down there and I would have been a farmer or calf roper or something because cowboy didn't pay much back then, but it, it did pay some. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I knew what I was doing with a horse. Daddy done taught me how to trade horses and... <laughs> always get some boot. Mm -hmm. One time I come through this little town of Melton 
He brought a big spotted horse, a three-year-old, unbroke, had me riding it, and it was a work type horse, had big feet, big headed. I didn't like it at all. Wondered why he bought it in the first place. Anyway, I come through this town in Little Melton. This man was ride was working a team of horses to a grader to pull grade the roads with. Didn't have all this stuff we got now, you know. This gray horse who got tired of that, and he'd lay down in the middle of the road and wouldn't get up <laughs> <laughs> with the horny song. <laughs> and I had seen him ride this horse. I knew about him. And he hollered at me and said, how did you trade for this gray horse? Trade that horse for this gray horse. Dad had always told me to get some boots, and I just said, I'll trade even with you, but you got to get him up. And he said, go get your daddy. He said, I can't trade to you, but I got to get his permission. Yeah. I told him, I said, you don't have to have dad's permission. Dad told me I could do the trading, and if I got cheated, I'd just be that way. But... You don't have to. No, he said, I don't trade with you. So I went and got dad, got back over there. Horse was up, has got his harness on. I told him, I said, get your harness off of him. The horse belongs to me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he got pulled it off, and I put my saddle on him. And uh, I got him saddled by this fellow. Looked at Dad, and Dad's name was Guy. He said, Guy, don't you let this boy ride this horse. Dad looked at me and said, get on him, Bill, and let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> I rode him. He was the gray horse I called him. Oh, him. yeah. I rode him. Still had him when the war was over. Really? It started, you know. Your dad yeah. had a lot of confidence in you, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, he was. Well, my dad knew what I could do. Sure. <laughs> he knew what you could do. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let's see. Okay, so that's a good question. What What would you like people today to know about this period of history? Like the, the, the World War II period of history. What would you like people today to know about it? Well, <laughs> I like from the note like it was, like we're telling it, and to not fix us where we ever have to do it again. That means our leaders and all. Mm -hmm. that, that, you know, we're all humans, and there's no reason why, just because we're a different color, it don't make any difference. We're pink, yellow, or green, or whatever. We're still humans. Mm -hmm. We ought to be able to get along. Mm -hmm. And uh, World War, of course, I've heard that World War One supposed to have been won so there'd be no more wars. <laughs> World War Two come along, and I expect some of these days we'll have another one. But I'm hoping that they learn enough from this that there will ever be another one. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, did you ever bring anything back from the war with you? I brought a barracks bag full of stuff back. Did you? <laughs> what kind of what kind of items did were you able wasn't, to liberate? <laughs> wasn't supposed to. Yeah. Every time that we made a stop anywhere, why they said over the loudspeakers, the last time turn in your guns or ammunition, I think it kind of threatened us if we didn't. I brought two German Lugers home with me. Awesome. I brought a double barrel shotgun with a rifle underneath <laughs> home with me. I brought a 28 gauge shotgun home with me. 
all in the birch bag, and I bought a, a little rifle, which was a thirty-two twenty or something like that. Nice little gun. After I got it home, I hunted deer with it a while, traded it off for a saddle. Anyway, why? And I bought some couple of swords that I took out of a French house or German house or something. But I had a pretty good bag of... And you got it all home with you, too. Yeah. That's pretty and, amazing. Well, yeah, I didn't pay no attention to them. I just yeah. brought it on. Yeah. <laughs> got it in Camp Chaffee, Arkansas. That's where they discharged me. And... I took it, well, we got in there at night. Next morning before I woke up, I heard them calling my name over the loudspeaker to come to the office up there. And I wondered, well, how in the world they wanted me so quick, you know. I got up, my mother and daddy both were standing there. Right uh. Some boy from out there where we lived had been discharged the day before, and he seen my name on the list where I'd be in that next day. And he beat it over there and told them I'd oh. be in Camp Chaffee. No kidding. So they come down and pick me up. Dad said, when can you go home? I said, right now. I don't know why I could or not, but I said that. <laughs> I threw that bag. So you went AWOL then, huh? <laughs> in his truck and went home. 